In this expansion, we've had Mythic Plus dungeons that correspond to each of the four elements, fire, earth, air, and water. Is this the best one? Hi, it's Lerald, and today I'm going to be talking about Throne of the Tides. It's a pretty fun dungeon. It's not that long, which is always a plus, and it's a W key dungeon. Kind of a, not a straight line, there's a bit of backtracking, but there's no alternate pathing or anything, and that's always convenient. It has a very different aesthetic from any other dungeon in WoW, and some really excellent voice lines on some of the bosses. Conceptually, lore-wise, vibe-wise, it's a decent dungeon. In terms of actually playing through it, eh, it hits really hard. That's my biggest complaint with this dungeon. It does a lot of damage. It's also rotten with caster mobs and nasty debuffs like bleeds, poisons, and diseases, so as usual, playing a dwarf in this dungeon is super OP. I like it, but it's one of the harder dungeons this season, and it wouldn't have been my first choice of Cataclysm dungeon to bring back. Cooldown usage is very important here in this dungeon as a tank because of the amount of damage it deals. Also, the gauntlet at the end and the final boss kind of make what had been an otherwise pretty good dungeon up to that point end on a sour note. Basically, it continues Blizzard's trend of bringing back old, fairly well-liked dungeons and then overtuning them way too much. I wanted to like this dungeon a lot more than I actually have. I don't hate it, but when this season's over, I'm not going to miss it. Now for the usual disclaimer before I walk through the route. My goal is to talk about what I do to maximize the group's chances of finishing the dungeon easily and relatively quickly, and limit the possibility for other players to make mistakes. This is specifically oriented toward pug groups, and it is definitely not the most efficient route possible, which is fine. You can pull more aggressively if your group is up to it, but with that being said, this route should be good all the way from a plus two up to about a 23 to 25. For higher levels, I would be more aggressive throughout the entire dungeon, especially in some of the earlier pulls. I would probably just pull more stuff together at once. Now here is my MDT route for this dungeon. It's on the screen right now. I'll put a pastebin link to copy the import string into your MDT in the pinned comment, and I, as always, recommend using MDT it's a great add-on. All right, so now let's just go through this MDT here. You'll see I've drawn some arrows once again. We obviously start here down at the entrance and uh, just move straight forward up through here until we reach this elevator in this circular area here. And then you just again continue straight forward all the way through to the first boss, Lady Najar. And then at that point you backtrack, come through, kill the second boss here, make your way down the elevator again making a left once you've come out of the elevator to the third boss and then going all the way back to where you were before, straight ahead and straight down the final alley to the final boss. Now let's actually talk about these pulls a little bit. This is the first pull that I like to do with most groups. It is the first pull, the third pull, and the patrol that's in between them. The main danger to the tank here is the vicious snapdragons. They apply razor jaws. It is a stacking bleed debuff and Per stack, it's not that bad, but once you get to five or more stacks, it can be pretty deadly, and they can really stack it up pretty quickly. So if these guys are staying alive in any of the pulls that you're tanking them in, which they show up in quite a few pulls, they can be pretty nasty. And the damage is very backloaded, so you don't want to like panic cooldown right off the bat necessarily because you also want to have that cooldown available for later once this bleed is really rolling. Pally and again Dwarf are really really strong here because of the ability to remove bleeds but also just the ability to divine shield being really really good. Now as you're gathering all this stuff up it can be pretty dangerous. A more aggressive strategy would be to bring in this second pull as well but I prefer to just do the front three most of the time and then chain into the second pull. If you're feeling a little squeamish, you can cut this third pull out and just do the front pull and the patrol, but you know, you're going to have bloodlust here, so you're generally better off doing all three at once and just using cooldowns and being very aggressive defensively. Then it's pretty much just straightforward, one pull at a time. The second pull has oracles, uh, two oracles. Technically, the first pull has one oracle in it, but the second pull has two, and they really love to cast Healing Wave anytime any of their allies get low health. You can stun that or interrupt it, either is fine, that will put it on cooldown if you don't actually interrupt it, but you just really want to be keyed in on them casting Healing Wave. They're kind of all throughout the dungeon and they really, really love to Healing Wave. 
The Ravager here, there's only two of her. Her main mechanic that you're going to have to deal with is the tank is the volatile bolt that she drops on the ground or the volatile acid she drops on the ground. It just creates an area denial circle. You pull her out of it. That's pretty much it. Once you've gone up, you're going to face another gauntlet here, sort of another hallway, but then this will have a gauntlet. It has these two murloc poles that will actually run forward past these sentinels. And I like to do at the bare minimum the two pulls at the front, which are again two invaders, very basic auto attack guys, and then an oracle and a tempest witch. So again, you want to be keyed in on and locking down that healing wave from the oracle. If you're feeling comfortable, if you're feeling like basically if it's not uh, bolstering weak and it is tyrannical, then you definitely want to pull these two sentinels in. As long as you have defensive cooldowns and stuff, pull all three of these packs in together along with these murlocs and burn it all down. If it's bolstering weak, maybe don't do that. You know, kind of play it based on how you feel defensively as to whether you feel safe pulling these guys in or not. In the next area, this is almost entirely an area of playing it based on how you feel defensively. The first pull is going to have two casters in it. They're both Tempest Witches, so there's not anything super important to key in on for interrupting but they will just stand still and spam cast, and this Ravager patrols the area, and if she walks into you, it can cause you while you're standing there fighting these three guys, she can walk into you and then also chain this pull in, and now instead of fighting three guys at once, you're fighting eight guys and a giant Ravager, so nine guys, quite a bit more dangerous if you weren't prepared for it. A very simple trick, and I'll actually just throw in some footage here of me doing this, is to pull this pull, this three mob pull, establish threat, and then step out of line of sight. And that'll cause the casters to run forward toward you. And then now they're quite a bit further away. Pretty easy to deal with. If you're feeling tanky, if you have defensive cooldowns ready, especially if it's on a tyrannical week, you can move forward and gather up some of this stuff. If you're on a vengeance demon hunter or a protection paladin and you're able to lock down these casters, because that is the main bulk of the damage dealt to the group by these packs. You can just go in guns blazing and pull all this stuff together and burn it down, keep it all silenced, and that'll work too. I like to lock down and deal with the Ravager before I move on to the rest of the pulls in this area. And then basically you have the Snapdragon pack, and depending on whether your group has cooldowns ready or not, you can either try to pull one of these caster sets and again use line of sight, use interrupts, whatever you can. While the Snapdragon pull has run away, you can pull the caster pack back, deal with them, and they get the Snapdragons on their own. That's sort of the safe approach. Or you can intentionally wait for the Snapdragons to get near a caster pack, go in guns blazing, cooldowns active, AoE CC the Snapdragons down, put down our Souls Vortex, leg sweep, bring a piece, that kind of thing, burn them down, clean up the casters once that's done, and then clean up the casters on the other side, and then get this pull here in the middle and go to the first boss. You technically speaking don't have to do all of the pulls in this room for percent, like if we drop this pull, that's actually 100.7%. But you do need to do all the pulls in this room so that you can safely do the boss in this room and not have somebody get knocked into one of these pools or one of these pulls and now suddenly you're having to fight a bunch of dangerous trash mobs while you're also fighting the boss. That's no good. So once you've dealt with the first boss, you come back out and deal with the second boss. Then you come through the hallway here and you have to slide between some tentacles. You take the elevator back down and now you come to my favorite part of the dungeon. You come downstairs, you take a left, and you have these Faceless Watchers, and then these packs of a Faceless Seer and four minions of Gersha. I like to pull these together, chain these together, and really just focus and interrupt the Faceless Seer. They like to spam cast Mind Flay, they also passively spawn lines of shadow damage that silence, so you want to make sure you don't get clipped by those. Really just interrupting the Mind Flay on cooldown is uh, super important. This overlaps, the, the lines that they put out overlap with the Shadow Smash that these Faceless Watchers do. They cast Clinching Tentacles, which mass grips everybody to them, and then they follow it up with Shadow Smash, where you have two seconds to run out of melee range from these guys, or they'll blast you with a massive amount of shadow damage. Often while running out, people will run through this Null Blast line, so you want to be really, really careful not to do that, because it will silence you, it'll also do a lot of damage, and uh, that's just no good. In terms of affix overlap, uh, storming, entangling, and volcanic can all be pretty nasty in this section. I wouldn't let that 
like slow me down from pulling faster. I would just try to do what I could to clear out the stormings before the group gets gripped in by clinching tentacles, like intentionally get hit with the hope of getting pulled back down to melee range by a clinching tentacle and then running out and making sure that there were no stormings in the way for everybody to kill them. So you do this pull once, then you do it again, and then you have this set of pulls here. Two Faceless Ears, just spam and Mind Flay and Null Blast, and two Faceless Watchers using Clinching Tentacles and Shadow Smash. You can pull these together depending on how the group is doing. Once this pull gets near the end, I like to hold my AoE cooldowns for this next pull, the six minions of Gersha. All they do is spam AoE damage, but it's six of them and they do a lot of damage. So I think it's really important to have as much AoE damage as you can going into this final pull before the third boss so that you can really, really just absolutely turbo nuke them. And any sort of AoE CCs, AoE silences, that kind of thing are really useful on these guys as well. Then you fight the third boss, he blasts your face in half, and you run all the way back out the same way you came and straight ahead down the final hallway to the last boss. This is the gauntlet, this is the part of the dungeon that is hell. I have tagged all of this stuff out in a very safe way, you know, one pull at a time. You can double up on some stuff here if things are going really smoothly, but the safest approach is just one pull at a time. This first pull has two different types of mobs in it. It has these hunters that like to leap out of melee range and throw spears at random targets. They also like to hit you with the poison spear, so if you're on a dwarf, but also a paladin, a monk, or a druid, being able to remove poisons from yourself in this area is really important because it will stack repeatedly, and these guys like to stack you up to four times, which is one of the more dangerous spots in the dungeon that doesn't involve the dogs that apply the bleed. The other mobs are the Gilgoblin Gil Aquamages. Blah, tongue twister. All they really do is a very long, slow cast that throws out a giant blast of frost damage. Basically, it's like a pyroblast, but made out of water. And you just want to interrupt them. It's really not that complicated. Interrupt them, stun them, whatever you got to do. So you burn these guys down and then you move forward to the Tainted Sentry. And they're really the bigger danger in this section. They only have one skill. It's Swell. It just does a bunch of AoE shadow damage over four seconds. And it's not that bad on its own. But when you kill the little unstable corruptions that are in this area, they apply a stacking debuff. Now this tooltip says it, the debuff causes you to take 1% increased shadow damage. That's off by a factor of 10. It's 10% 10 more shadow damage per stack for eight seconds. It also deals some nature damage when they die. The range on this and on the swell is 60 yards, so it's not possible to outrange any of it. You just have to deal with it. The problem is that this whole area is filled with these unstable corruption guys, and until you've killed all of the trash, they will not stop respawning. So you kind of have to balance the way that you pull the tainted sentries with the debuffs that you have from the little guys in the area. The debuff only lasts for 8 seconds or so, and they don't cast Swell immediately on pulling, but they will cast it about 4 seconds into the pull, so if you're about to pull one of these guys and the group has like 20 stacks of the little guy debuff, you kind of want to wait a couple of seconds before pulling so that it'll fall off, so that you're not taking the Swell with 20 stacks and basically taking 3 Swells at once. Once you've dealt with these guys and you've dealt with the next pull, and then you've dealt with this tainted sentry pack, then I like to do this six aqua mage pull all at once. Now if you're on a demon hunter or a prop paladin, you can use sigil of silence, you can use sigil of chains, you can use divine toll, and you can absolutely just banish these casters to the nether realm. No problem. Leg sweep, shockwave, fear, uh, blinding sleep, that sort of AoE CC are okay, but these guys do have a decent amount of health, so actually burning them down before they can all turn and one bang somebody with six water bolts to the face is kind of sketchy. You really want to use every bit of AoE CC you have, any sort of single target crowd control interrupts that kind of thing as well, and you just basically want to focus these guys down. Then finally you have the Tainted Sentry pull here, the, the two Tainted Sentries at once, and I know a lot of people like to bloodlust this pull. I'm not a huge fan just because the final boss is so frustrating, so painful. And even though you have two of them at once, they don't swell at the same time. They basically do them back to back. One will do his, I guess, about four seconds into the pull, and then the next one will do it about one second after the first has ended. So you get like eight seconds of unbroken swell, which can be kind of bad. But if you're here after you've killed the Aquamages, you have a couple of seconds left of the debuff 
ready to go. Just hold the group for just a second for the debuff to be close to expiring and then move forward into this pull and it will be actually significantly less dangerous than this pull right here, the 24th pull that I have marked where you have potentially 15, 20 stacks of swell and you're taking double or even triple damage from that swell. Getting two of them back to back generally will be less painful even though that sounds counterintuitive, it'll be generally less painful to just deal with that damage over a lot longer period of time than to have it all in one burst. Finally, once all of this is over, once you've made it through the gauntlet from hell, give your healer a chance to drink because they haven't had a chance to drink throughout this whole process. They've been having to heal probably a lot throughout this whole area. So you definitely want to be sure that your healer has a couple of seconds to drink before you pull Azamat. Then you pull the boss, kill him, that's the end of the dungeon. Now let's talk about bloodlust points. I always bloodlust the first pull. You do over 60% of the dungeon's trash before you reach the first boss, so it's completely wasteful to not bloodlust right off the start of the, of the dungeon. Sometimes bloodlust will come up for the first boss, but I prefer to hold it for the second. The second boss is a lot more burnable than the first boss, so first pull, second boss, and then preferably the last boss. And I think those are really just the three spots that you're going to get bloodlust in here. If you're really zooming and you don't have it available for the second boss, I mean, wow, you're really moving through this place. I guess I would use it on the third boss, or maybe just hold it for the fourth boss. Just get two bloodlust. Again, good problem to have. Now let's talk about bosses, and we'll start with Lady Najjar. This is a super basic tank fight. The main mechanic of the fight for the tank really is just the intermissions that summon adds, and there are two of those in this fight. Picking up the adds super quickly before they auto attack anybody is very important here. In terms of the main phase of the fight, her mechanics are Shock Blast, which goes on random non-tanks, it makes them explode and shoot out orbs, so that person just wants to run away and everybody else just needs to dodge the orbs. Focus Tempest is her next ability. The name is a lie. It does random target damage. That's not focused. It is a Tempest though, so I guess it's only like a 50% lie. It's also not all that interesting. It's not necessarily easy. The infinite scaling content, eventually it's going to be enough to threaten people's lives, but it's just random targeted damage. You can help heal it if you're able. Paladin, Bear Druid, that sort of thing. Otherwise, there's not really anything you can do. The boss also casts Water Bolt, and that's interruptible, so help with that. The intermission, like I said, is the main mechanic of the fight for the tank, and those occur at 60 and 30% health. She will run to the middle of the room, go immune to damage, and summon three main adds. The phase ends when those adds die. You kind of want to treat this like a normal trash pull, where you just drag the adds together and cleave them all down. While the intermission is going on, there will be geysers erupting throughout the throughout the area, and you want to make sure not to get hit with those because they will knock you up and do a lot of damage. The main ad that you need to pick up is the Najjar Honor Guard, and it spawns in the back of the room. It spawns in a fixed location in each intermission. It's the back of the room relative to where you walked in. They auto attack and they have a normal threat table. They are dangerous to anybody else in the group, really. So you want to pick those guys up as soon as you can. And their only actual mechanic is that they cast Trident Fury. Basically, they'll dash across the room toward one of your ranged players and stab in a cone for four seconds. All you do is sidestep that pretty basic. The other two adds are Frost Witches. They spawn on the sides of the room and they just spam cast Frostbolt. Now you want to pick those up as well, but they're not really going to be trying to auto attack all that much. They're not as high of a priority as the Honor Guard. They also apply Icy Veins to themselves, just increasing their damage by a lot. So you want to interrupt them and dispel them if you can. Like, say you're playing a Blood Elf or a Demon Hunter, you can dispel the Icy Veins. Otherwise, just focus on interrupting them. Uh, and you can stun them and CC these guys as well. Basically, you just drag them together with the Honor Guard, cleave it all down. Now, there are also Murlocs during this phase. They just jump at random targets. They can't be tanked. You just cleave them down. But anything you have that does sort of AOE, CC, displacement, things like Ursal's Vortex, A-Bomb Limb, Sigil of Chains, Ring of Peace, all of those are pretty great for helping lock these Murlocs down because they will deal a lot of damage to the ranged DPS in your group. 
Usually I write myself some extra notes here to talk about what I do in taking the fight. I didn't do that on this fight, not because I forgot, but because there really isn't all that much to do as the tank in the main phase of the fight. You pick the boss up and pull her slightly out of the middle of the room. You dodge the shot glass balls. You help interrupt Water Bolt. That's pretty much it. The next boss is Commander Ulthok, and I think he's the most successful modern rework of an ancient boss in this expansion. He's not up against a ton of stiff competition, but I do still think it's a pretty good fight. It's also a fight that's really hard if you do it wrong, and pretty easy if you do it right, and I like that kind of fight. He's a great bloodlust target because he has a lot of health, and he can deal a lot of damage even if you're handling all the mechanics correctly, so getting the fight over with quickly is good. He has four main abilities, and they dictate how you move him through the room during the course of the fight. The first ability is Bubbling Fissure. It summons purple pools on the ground. These are all spawned at player's current locations. Standing in them deals damage and gives minus 100% haste. So what you want to do with this is every time it's about to come up, you ping for the group to stack up, everybody stacks up, and then you move away. As soon as the pools go down, you want to move the boss away from the pools a little bit and drag your party away from the danger. The next mechanic is Festering Shockwave. It knocks the group back. You want the boss between the party and the pools that are on the ground so that everyone gets knocked away from the pools, toward safety, instead of into a bunch of dangerous pools. It also applies a 12 second dot, so there is a healing check throughout the fight. The main tank mechanic is Crushing Claw. It's a pretty massive tank buster. It does a lot of physical damage, and it applies a 10 second 100% physical damage taken debuff, and overlaps with other mechanics. The debuff is really the more dangerous component of the, the mechanic here, because the initial hit is pretty big, but if you're prepared for it, it's not that bad. But then you have to deal with four or five more double hit auto attacks that can be pretty dangerous if you're also overlapping with other mechanics in the fight and you don't have cooldowns ready to cover that up. The final ability is Awaken Ooze. All it really does is it turns the pools into adds that basically just work like a pool that can move. They move really quickly, they can't be slowed, stunned, or gripped, or knocked, and they are applying not just the damage but the 100% negative haste debuff, so they're quite nasty. There is a way to deal with them, hitting them knocks them back. Resto and Balanced Druids can just spam Sunfire on the adds to constantly knock them back the entire time they're active, and that completely negates them as a mechanic. Now, they want to be careful, and you want to be careful too, to not knock them back too far. If they touch the door, the fight will reset. You also want to be careful not to let them eat your party though. So it's kind of the tank's job to play goalie here and keep these adds locked down. You have to actually hit them to knock them back though. Dots won't work, so not all tanks are equal here. Rushing Jade Wind and Spinning Crane Kick both count as hits with every single tick of the damage over time that they deal, and that makes them amazing for demolishing these guys. Monks are far and away the best tank at keeping these things locked down. Bear's in pretty good shape too, thanks to being able to spam, hit thrash, and then spam swipe in between. Paladins are mediocre, they can use Shield of the Righteous and Avenger Shield Bounces will do the job, Blessed Hammer will do the job, but Consecration won't. Vengeance Demon Hunter, Blood Decay, and Warrior all kind of struggle because they don't have spammable AoE to allow them to play goalie that effectively. So in terms of the dance of tanking this fight, this is the kind of boss who likes to show you all of his moves one after another at the start of the fight, and then swap up the order as it progresses to see if you can handle the overlaps. You want to start out by dropping the first set of pools near the entrance, and that'll be the first mechanic of the fight. Then you'll move away and get knocked into a nearby wall. You want to cool down the Crushing Claw when it comes out and lock down the adds when he spawns them, then drop new pools by the old pools. And this is the basic rhythm for the fight. Although the order will get mixed up a bit as it progresses, you always want to position the boss so that he's closer to the pools than the group, and you want to drop new pools by old pools, and then pull the boss away in preparation for the shockwave, and ping so that everyone gets on the correct side of the boss so that they get shockwaved away from the pools. On top of all of that, make sure you're cooldowning every crushing claw. They can overlap with adds coming up about 35 seconds into the fight, and then again at about 2 minutes and 15, and those spots can be pretty nasty. Mindbender Gersha is the third boss in this dungeon. 
This guy is a genuine tank murderer. He puts a ton of stress on the healer and DPS as well. He's legitimately very tough. This is a two-phase fight, and phase one lasts for the first 75% of Aranok Stone Speaker's health bar. Aranok is an enhancement shaman. He's being mind-controlled by a Shadow Priest Mindbender. It's a pretty simple fight, really, but it deals insane damage. He is going to beat your brains in, but don't worry, it won't be complicated. His main mechanic for, for the tank is Storm Flurry Totem. It's on a 26 second cooldown, it grants him a 100% attack speed increase and makes every hit deal nature damage. It adds so much damage. It, he can kill your entire family with one Storm Flurry Totem. Major cooldowns during this are critical. You want to put them up as soon as that totem is going down. You also want to immediately pull the boss to the totem and focus it down. That is the top damage priority whenever it is up. His second mechanic is Flame Shock. It goes on allies, he applies two at once, so you have to dispel one and heal the other. Well, the healer has to do that, you're not doing any of that. You're just trying to stay alive. The healer in this fight is going to be stressed, so if possible, you do want to help them. That's not always possible, though. Earth Fury is the final mechanic in Phase 1, and it causes the ground beneath players to erupt on a short delay, so you don't want to be stacked here, and you don't really need to just run the whole time this mechanic is happening. There is kind of a delay, so you want to stutter step your movements a bit. Wait, move a couple of steps, wait, move a step, wait, move a step, and that usually gets the job done. I think you really only have to do two or three moves, depending on your timing, to not get hit by the Earth Fury at all. Phase 2 starts at 25%. As soon as Phase 2 starts, any existing Storm Flurry totems will be removed. They'll just despawn instantly. At this point, Mindbender Gersha detaches from Aranok. He immediately casts Terrifying Vision, which deals a bunch of damage and fears anybody who's in line of sight of him. So you want to line of sight the boss behind a pillar or one of the big crystal orbs near the entrance. You can use Anti-Magic Shell or Lichborn if you're on a Death Knight, or you can use Divine Shield or, I guess, Spell Warding on a Paladin, although I wouldn't waste Spell Warding on this mechanic, I'd just line of sight. Mindbitter Gersha casts Terrifying Vision on a 20 second cooldown, and he deals random damage to the group while he's active, and that's it. It's very simple, but it can be really deadly at higher levels, so any help healing you can provide is good if you have it available, and group cooldowns like Rallying Cry, Darkness, and Anti-Magic Zone are also really useful. This fight is a very hard throughput and tankiness check. The only movement requirements are going to the totem and the small stutter steps you have to do for Earth Fury, and then I guess line of sighting the fear in phase two. It's a fun fight, a very hard fight, like a nightmare version of fighting a training dummy, but great if you like a numerical challenge. Azamat is the final boss, and he was by far the boss I was most concerned about in terms of whether Blizzard could translate a Cataclysm boss into the modern Mythic Plus state of the game successfully. I do not think they have stuck the landing here. This fight kinda stinks. It's a disappointing end to an otherwise pretty good dungeon. It's an ad fight, it's a ground effect fight, and it's a stationary boss fight, and the way that all three of these overlap isn't great. It's a two-phase fight, but phase one is the real fight. Once you've reached phase two, you basically have 10 or 15 seconds and then the boss is dead. Ozumat has five main mechanics in Phase 1, Ink of Ozumat is the main boss that you're actually fighting in Phase 1, and for the most part throughout the fight. You want to stay in melee range of the Ink of Ozumat at all times. It has an 8 second cool up at the start of the fight, but if you leave melee range at any point after that, he will spam Foul Bolt on you, basically until you're dead, usually one or two hits. Now you can spell reflect this, so if you're feeling brave, and warriors usually are, you can intentionally use spell reflect, step out of melee range for one foul bolt, and then get back in, and use that to add a ton of extra damage. That's a pretty good move, actually. The first actual tank mechanic of the fight is Merc Spew. It's a frontal cone, and it is the main tank mechanic. You want to face the boss away from the group, pretty much at all times. That's really all there is to it. It does a lot of spell damage, use defensive cooldowns to mitigate it, but it's, it doesn't have any other sort of lingering effects other than just that it deals damage up front. Blotting Barrage drops pools on players. They last forever and they grow constantly. It's really important that players try to stack these close to each other and sort of slightly off the boss if possible, especially later on in the fight when you're running out of room. 
Putrid Roar deals group damage and applies a damage over time effect, and it also summons adds. And adds are the most annoying, difficult aspect of the fight. When the adds come out, they come out five at once. There are two splotches and three sludges. You have to get all of them picked up as quickly as you can. The splotches are casters, and interrupting them can suck because they can spawn all over the room, opposite sides of the boss, 40 yards away from each other. It's pretty easy on Paladin, Vengeance, Demon Hunter. Death Grip is also strong, pretty brutal on Monk, Warrior. It's kind of mid on Druid. You can at least hit him with Moonfire. That helps. The sludges are just melee doofuses, they drop pools when they die, it is the same pool as Blotting Barrage, so it's super important that they aren't under the boss, and they need to be outside of the boss's hitbox. The final mechanic of Phase 1 interacts with the pools, it's Cleansing Flux, and that's a buff from Neptulon. He chooses two random non-tank targets and grants them shadow damage immunity, and a buff that allows them to clear shadow pools. Basically, they become the clean team. This is why the adds dying needs to not be directly under the boss. It's so that the clean team can sweep up the goo from the adds and the blotting barrage all at the same time. They have to actually stand in the pools until they despawn. It takes a few seconds. If this is done right, the fight is not too bad. It's pretty manageable. It's, it's actually kind of fun. If it's done wrong, and eventually it usually does get done wrong, it becomes very hard. If you're in a bad situation, what you want to do is just Use your defensive cooldowns and do the best you can to stay alive until the group can clear out the pools on the next Cleansing Flux cycle. Once you've done this long enough to get the Ink of Azamat down to zero health, you'll start phase two. Neptulon gives the group a massive health and damage buff, everybody gets huge, and you attack Azamat directly. Azamat deals tons of group-wide damage, but has no other mechanics, so if someone dies and isn't alive when that buff goes out, and then you try to res them after you've already started phase 2, they won't get the health bonus and they will instantly die, so resing anybody during this phase is pointless, instant death. Other than that, you just focus Azamat down, just hit him, he's a training dummy, burn him down, he's dead, that's the fight. In terms of managing the fight, it's all about being prepared for each mechanic as they come out. Positioning the adds so that they don't die directly under the boss is really, really critical. It's, I mean, it is the most important aspect of the fight as the tank. They need to die far enough away from the boss so that the clean team can sweep them up once they get Cleansing Flux. As long as you manage that and you live through the Merc Spews, this guy isn't too bad. One little extra tip I have for helping make sure the clean team actually cleans, uh, cleansing fluxes up the ad pools is to ping the ads as soon as cleansing flux is coming out. The ping system is really good, definitely important to make as much use of that as you can to direct people and make the fight easier for everyone. If I had to really nail it down, my problem with this fight is that the punishment for the ads dying in the wrong spot is just too damn high. The pools expand too quickly, the cleanup timer is too tight, and the boss is stationariness sucks. Stationary bosses usually aren't great, and uh, this one is no exception. And that's Throne of the Tides. It wasn't my favorite dungeon back in Cataclysm, but I did like it a lot. In Dragonflight Season 3, it's definitely still not my favorite. I wanted to like this dungeon a lot, I think it's better than Vortex Pinnacle was, but it could have been more successful than it is. The final hallway at the end and the last boss are just so hard compared to the rest of the dungeon, and that causes the dungeon to end on kind of a down note. You spend the whole run knowing that the end is going to be really painful, and then you unfortunately are proven right when you get there, and it tries really, really hard to kill you and everyone else in the group. All in all, it's an okay dungeon. Not bad. Not great. It's hard in a really painful way in some spots, and hard in a really fun way in some spots. It has one of the most fun first pulls in this season, but it's just not a complete success from start to finish. Alright, that's it. Thanks for watching. Bye.